Rakuten is proud to present Elizabeth the First, the new podcast about Elizabeth Taylor as the original influencer. She was famous for her impeccable style, and Rakuten wants to help you save on the styles you love. Shopping for the perfect holiday party outfit? Rakuten makes it possible with cash back, deals, and coupons. Save money at stores you love. Get started at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N, Rakuten.com. Twenty eleven Warsaw. Operation Roadhouse is swinging into action. Gary Hamilton's camper van rolls into its position near the Roadhouse dock. It will sit there for the next two years as undercover agents begin documenting the crimes of this fishing obsessed town. At that very moment, I'm living in New York City. I'm trying to make it as a writer, and to make ends meet, I buy and sell luxury foods, like truffles and caviar. Much like a drug dealer, the job involves pushing weight. The heavier the product, the higher the profit. I wake up at the crack of dawn and get into a refrigerated truck to drive to one of the cargo hangars at JFK Airport. I clutch my customs paperwork as I walk inside the office attached to one of the hangars. I'm here to pick up a shipment of truffles that arrived by air freight overnight, having been foraged in Italy just a few days ago. Sitting in a dingy, fluorescent-lit room, I nervously snack on vending machine chips while the clerk checks my shipment. Each shipment of truffles can be worth up to $100,000. If just one invasive bug is found, then customs will destroy the whole box. The airport hangar is like a twilight parallel world. I catch glimpses of crate loads of live puppies, towering stacks of bananas, boxes of high heels, and oysters on ice. Even US citizens who die overseas come in this way. Their bodies are transported in long styrofoam containers as they head toward their final resting places. But I'm not here for the bodies. I sit waiting for caviar, wild mushrooms, or foraged foods like prickly ash, sumac, huckleberries, or whatever else my restaurant clients crave. It's surreal. I'm in my mid-20s, just a kid. Back in my apartment, I'm living off of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. But at work, I'm rubbing shoulders with Michelin-starred chefs and getting to sample some of the luxury food products I sold them. I load my bounty into a refrigerated backpack and ride the subway around Manhattan, making sale after sale. I carry around a scale to measure out white truffles, which, depending on the season, might cost between three to $6,000 a pound. If you've never smelled a truffle, its scent can seem borderline offensive. White truffles can smell like a combination of weed, Parmesan cheese, and Italian sausage. One time, a fellow passenger on the subway accuses me of taking a shit. I'm so embarrassed, I get off and walk the 20 blocks to my next delivery. One day, I'm making a big caviar deal in Hoboken, New Jersey. We pull out all the stops to impress the restaurant wholesaler with a full caviar tasting. We even give them some paddlefish roe to try. But we have all this extra caviar left over. So on the way back, somewhere between the Jersey Turnpike and Manhattan, we make a pit stop at Dunkin' Donuts. We order a couple of mediocre bagels with cream cheese and smother them in obscene amounts of caviar. When I say we, the other person in the van is Ian Perkayastha, my boss at the time. He isn't even technically an adult, but at 19, he's teaching me everything he knows about how to make a good sale. Ian had been moving in this world far longer than me, and he's still in it today. I'm Helen Holliman from Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci. 
This is the Paddlefish Caviar Heist, Episode 6, Bait and Switch. If you think cash back at thousands of your favorite stores sounds too good to be true, think again. With Rakuten, you can save on whatever you're buying for the holidays. So while you're getting gifts for friends and family, get some cash back for yourself, too. Don't forget festive home decor, party outfits, and that trip to see your fam. Because shopping for everything is much more magical with cash back. Rakuten makes it so easy. Here's how it works. Rakuten partners with stores you know and love. Places like American Eagle, Aveda, Finish Line, GameStop, Lancome and more. These stores actually pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares that money with you as cash back. You can even stack coupons and deals on top of cash back. Cha-ching! Shop at Rakuten.com or by using the Rakuten app and you'll get your cash back payments through PayPal or check. It's that easy. Start your holiday shopping with Rakuten now to save money at over 3,500 stores. Join for free at Rakuten.com or get the Rakuten app. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N. Rakuten.com. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast, wherever you listen. My name is Ian Perkayastha, and I'm the founder and owner of Regalis Foods, a specialty foods company that imports specialty foods from around the world. And I distribute to high-end restaurants across the country. I've been in the industry for the last 15 years. Ian is a big fish in the New York City specialty food world the go-to source for truffles, caviar, and other luxury foods. His career began after he moved from Texas to Arkansas as a teen. I'd arrived from Houston in Arkansas, I guess it was 2006, and it was just totally culture shocking. Ian's new home in Fayetteville, Arkansas, not too far from the Ozarks, is a complete culture shock after Houston. I mean, the Ozarks are deeply conservative. Almost everyone wears camouflage. It's beautiful and scenic, but definitely very conservative. As a young person plucked from their old life, Ian feels lost. He needs a way to make new friends. So he does what any self-respecting high schooler with an entrepreneurial side would do. Starts up a fancy food club. The food club was really just born out of my love of interesting, rare foods that weren't super accessible in Arkansas. To cover the cost of ingredients, everyone would chip in five or $10. And so as these parties grew and grew, it gave me an opportunity to try new foods that would have otherwise been prohibitively expensive. It grew from about 15 kids to about 75 kids by the time I graduated high school. At one party, they have a paddlefish cookout. But there's a catch. Ian has to snag the paddlefish himself. Not something he'd ever done before. One of my best friends was an avid fisherman and would often catch paddlefish, or snag them, rather. And essentially, you're just putting a massive hook on your reel and wading into the water and casting in random directions and reeling in and hoping that that massive hook snags a fish. It's pretty archaic, but we we ended up catching a paddlefish that was probably around 70, 80 pounds. A 70 pound paddlefish is about four to six feet long. Perhaps not the biggest catch compared to the 150 pounders, but these beasts are strong and can put up a fight. It takes an incredible effort to land. It was definitely pretty bizarre to be kind of wading in a shallow, somewhat stagnant river, only to find like a shark-like massive fish come out of the water. I mean, it was a pretty wild experience. I had never seen a fish that size before up close, and also kind of depressing that we had caught this massive monster. 
I find it pretty heartbreaking to picture that fish fighting for its life for hours. Fast forward, and Ian has turned this passion into a multi-million dollar business. He clearly has a natural gift for talking people into trying new food. So I'm interested to hear how he explains the different grades of caviar. There's over 30 different species of sturgeon that are harvested for their eggs to turn into caviar. I guess the most prominent species was the beluga sturgeon, which was the largest of all the species, which unfortunately, due to severe overfishing in the Caspian, was deemed unsustainable and imports were cut off in 2005 in the U.S. This is the site's legislation that we heard about back in episode three. Remember, after it came into force, all imported caviar had to be sourced sustainably. So with beluga kind of out of the picture, the species that I would say is second best, that's most commonly consumed across the caviar space is the Osetra. This species takes typically between eight and 10 years to mature before it can bear eggs. Osetra is definitely the most expensive in price. And between Osetra and the very bottom, I would say there's Siberian sturgeon. When you go all the way down the caviar hierarchy, from the most coveted to the least desirable, you will eventually arrive at paddlefish. With a low price to match, that is how you can make money. Paddlefish, hackleback, bowfin, I would say those species are definitely kind of on the low end in terms of price, you know, flavor profile, just in terms of where they stack up in recognition in the caviar space. Fraud has always been an issue in the luxury food game. So when I tell Ian about Operation Roadhouse, he doesn't seem surprised. There's just a lot of shysty mislabeling that can occur and misinformation that's spread with all of these products. I know of several caviar companies that were essentially raided and the owners arrested in the 90s because of either mail fraud or basically selling caviar as one species, but the actual product being a different species, false labeling. It's not just about deceiving caviar connoisseurs. These are serious financial crimes. Trust and transparency are fundamental to a dealer-customer relationship working in this space. For me to begin a new relationship, I really have to um, be extremely confident that what I'm buying is legally caught and properly produced. Have you ever dealt with any uh, Russian caviar dealers? I've dealt with a few in New York but I typically try to uh, stay clear. Why is that? It's not like I have anything against the Russian caviar dealers, but um, I've got to be paying attention, <laughs> if that makes sense, with every interaction to ensure that everything is on the up and up. As a caviar dealer, you can't always know if you're being duped. If you're low on product, there's times when you need to buy from other dealers to keep your customers happy. You buy, sell, and trade on trust. I know that Ian used to sell paddlefish caviar. I used to sell it for him. So I brace myself and ask Ian, straight up. We used to sell paddlefish back in the day, back in like 2011. So, I mean, thinking back to when this took place, is there any world in which we could have potentially been selling Roadhouse Row? Um, I mean, it's unlikely that any of the paddlefish that we were selling was from this operation, just because of the year in which this occurred. Is he getting his wires crossed? Maybe he's thinking about Rob Farr's first operation. I remind him that Roadhouse started in 2011. Well, I mean, that it is. <laughs> I guess it could be possible then. It's very easy to acquire paddlefish in the market today from states like Oklahoma and Arkansas and Missouri. Even today, I mean, there's not a whole lot of regulation that has to be adhered to when buying 
paddlefish eggs. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if illegal poaching and illegal fishing continues to happen. Ugh. So there is every chance I could have been unintentionally pushing Roadhouse Row. The domestic industry has never been tightly regulated. The truth is, I've always seen myself as someone who cares deeply about the natural world. It's not like I didn't care about these fish back then. I was drawn to this story because of the rage I felt towards poachers. Having spent six months reporting on this story, that concern has only deepened. To learn that I may have been complicit really makes me question my role in all of this. As a dealer, was I both pushing the demand for this stuff and inadvertently covering up how it was sourced? Somewhere along the way, it feels like I've gotten derailed, too caught up in my own story. But in chatting with Ian, I realize these are two sides of the same coin. The only way I might have been selling Warsaw Row is if the Roadhouse poachers were selling to the black market and smuggling to New York. To find out if I was guilty, I needed to work out once and for all if the Roadhouse poachers really were mafia. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. In the last episode, we heard that Operation Roadhouse target Peter Babanko wouldn't speak to us. But his lawyer did agree to go on the record. I'm Neil Saltzman, located currently in the Hamptons area in New York State, right by the beach. Unfortunately, it's a rainy day. Neil works in litigation and family law, so I'm curious to know how this New York City lawyer ended up defending a man accused of wildlife crime. Where I work primarily is Manhattan, and there's not a lot of wildlife poaching going on there. I wouldn't be the most obvious address for this. I found it interesting. I found the entire topic interesting. When I discovered that his arrest had been the fruit of a two-year-long undercover operation operated by the government on the shores in Missouri, it became even more interesting. Neil sympathizes with Babanko. He's a hardworking person. He's a family person. I know he has at least one child. He's married. His wife, I believe, was at the time a nurse. I think he was an honest person and a a person who, who believed in fulfilling his responsibilities to his family. He really believed in his own innocence. He was not willing to make a deal just to be done with it. How exactly does Babanko end up buying paddlefish in rural Missouri? At the time, he was operating uh, these sort of ethnic food markets. So he traveled around the northeastern part of the United States to different communities doing this. And that's how he made a living. And he has a store, or had a store, in New Jersey. And he had been there for the purpose of doing that. He knew people in the community as a result. He was contacted by Bogdan Nehepetyan with a proposal to buy Paddlefish Row. Bogdan Nehepetyan is the guy police accuse of purchasing Paddlefish on behalf of Peter Babanko. After Nehepetyan is arrested, he flips. He enters into a plea agreement with prosecutors. It means he can avoid more serious offenses 
But in return, he must testify against Babanko. He was adversarial because he was a cooperating witness with the government. And I think that he sought to absolve himself of certain responsibility and attribute certain knowledge to Mr. Babenko that perhaps he had and Mr. Babenko did not. And he decided to, I guess, kind of wheel and deal and make a deal using Babenko, and he would be the middleman, essentially putting this deal together. Neil has questions about the undercover agents at the roadhouse. Was their role to in some way entice people to engage in criminal activity? Or was their role simply to give people with a pre-existing intent the opportunity to act on it? Perhaps Bogdan had gone initially really just to fish for his paddlefish row that he could legally consume with his family. I don't know. It was a place that the government had established where people interested in getting paddlefish, legally or not, might congregate. This is something that Bogdan Nahapetian himself raises when he's arrested. He says that he would never have bought paddlefish in the first place if it wasn't offered by the agents. Who knows if that's true? What is clear? The cops believed he and Bobanko were serious about selling the paddlefish row. That's why once Bobanko left Warsaw with their haul of caviar, the cops stepped up their pursuit. They used several teams of agents and a couple of cars to follow Babenko traveling from Missouri to New Jersey. And they filmed most of that journey. After they got to New Jersey, they placed some kind of tracking device on his car for a couple of months, I think. It yielded nothing of interest, nothing that was used at trial. Neil thinks the cops went too far, trying to prove a banco was selling on the black market. They subsequently sent an agent into his store in New Jersey to buy the paddlefish row that was available for sale there. But they had sent someone there to pretend to be buying items for a girl's night out party. <laughs> it's really silly. And then they had it genetically tested and they determined that it had not originated in Missouri. And in fact, I believe that at trial, there was testimony from someone from the government conceding that it appeared to be legally packaged. So there was nothing illegal about anything being sold in the store. Neil says that his client is not connected to the Russian mafia. You know, at least as far as all of the evidence and, and whatever I saw was concerned was a person who was unfortunately uninformed about the details of Missouri paddlefish regulation and was operating at the level of, you know, a small businessman. And the fate of the row uh, remains unknown. So I really think there was nothing nefarious in what he was doing and certainly and nothing ill-intentioned. I mean, it wasn't even a commercially very significant Quantity. I think, if I recall, it was about 80 pounds of roe, which is, you know, maybe two bar mitzvahs. But there were over 100 others charged during Roadhouse. Does Neil think there could have been a broader conspiracy? I didn't see evidence of any kind of large-scale operation. I don't know if such an operation is even feasible just in light of the nature of the product. I didn't see any evidence of this being anything more than basically personal consumption. And though the government seemed to get a lot of applause for it, I think my guy, Peter, might be the only one who went th all the way through trial on this out of everybody. For Neil, the whole undercover sting was overkill. It just seemed uh, way too much. And, you know, there are a lot of other crimes that I read about people committing brazenly that seem to go unattended to. Anyway, that's my personal feeling about it. And that raises questions. It appeared to me just that there's some sort of agenda driving this prosecution that was not simply for the purpose of protecting paddlefish. And what would those 
potentially be from your perspective? I know that a lot of the people who were charged with this were of Slavic extraction. They had foreign sounding names, so there may have been a sort of xenophobic part of it. And that xenophobia may have been influenced by media. We were in Jefferson City, Missouri. It was a jury of local people. It's a remote place. I don't know how often people from Jefferson City travel to New York and New Jersey, but probably not that often. And Peter Babenko is a, a Russian person who does not speak English fluently, who is quite a heavy set guy, Russian sounding name, and doesn't testify, and he's being accused by the government with a bunch of agents. It's easy to reach the wrong conclusion, I think. It's still a trial. It was still a case where the easiest conclusion for someone who wants to go home to reach is guilty. I have to admit, Neil's interview raises some big questions for me. For starters, is it really possible there was no poaching operation at all? I mean, could the government really have spent all this time and money on this incredibly intricate sting over several years just to bust a bunch of hapless characters looking to enjoy a bit of extra caviar with their families? It seems hard to believe. Remember the sheer volume of paddlefish that these guys were taking. Was there really no black market for this stuff? I need an expert's opinion. Someone who understands the buying and selling of caviar. Can you hear me? Yes. So, I call Ian. I wanted to compare notes because some things don't really add up for me. (laughs) I'm telling Ian about my conversation with Neil, Babenko's lawyer. I describe a conversation that took place during Operation Roadhouse between an undercover agent and a poacher. One of the accused actually talked about to an undercover agent. He's like, oh yeah, I'd love to take up to 100 paddlefish myself. I'll give the, the row to my family. The agent wants to know how many female paddlefish the poacher wanted. The poacher tells him, 50, 20, 100. We'll take them all. We have a big family. Now, that's a lot of row. Way more than any family could possibly consume. Which makes me think, don't you think that they were selling this stuff on the black market? Yeah, absolutely. A hundred fish, I mean, that's, you know, 700 pounds of row. (laughs) Definitely have been used for illegal caviar. That story doesn't quite add up in terms of the role being given to their family. I'm sure the main players that were busted were recruiting local fishermen to basically catch as many paddlefish as they could and obviously harvest their eggs and kind of use them in a way to to do the dirty work. Ian doesn't buy the idea that Peter Babenko wasn't selling. I would say with strong certainty he was definitely selling it through his specialty food company. They're not catching paddlefish and harvesting their eggs for no reason. I mean, it's pretty obvious that they were taking part in the black market caviar trade. When it comes to trial, Peter Babenko is convicted of violating the Lacey Act. He's found to have illegally trafficked paddlefish eggs across state lines. A handful of other suspects plead guilty to the same charges. But as Neil told us, Babenko is the only Roadhouse suspect to be brought to trial. And despite being found guilty, he doesn't end up serving prison time. In fact, most of the defendants were only accused of pretty minor violations. They end up paying fines, or they have their fishing licenses revoked. Of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that there was no poaching ring. These small-time poachers may have been doing the bidding of some other kingpins, as Ian suggested. But Neil's doubts do seem to tally with the fact that none of those who pled guilty during Roadhouse were ever made to testify against anyone higher up in the supposed conspiracy. So if the cops couldn't prove a Russian mafia plot, then what was the point of the elaborate and expensive Operation Roadhouse? Good defense attorneys going to do what good defense attorneys do and always try and downplay the severity of their clients' violations and that sort of thing. I get that. Well, it depends on who you ask. 
I trust the judgment of the prosecutors and judges in this case, and I'm extremely proud of the officers who documented such a large-scale amount of violations. That's next time. The Paddlefish Caviar Heist is a production of Imperative Entertainment and Vespucci and is written and hosted by me, Helen Holliman. For Imperative Entertainment, the executive producer is Jason Hoke. For Vespucci, the executive producers are Daniel Turkin and Johnny Galvin. David Gavi Herbert is executive producer. Based on original reporting by David Gavi Herbert, the series producer is Aaron Keller. The story editor is Matt Willis. Thomas Curry is the managing producer. Audio recording by Austin Sizzler at Eastside Studios. Audio mix and sound design by Matt Peaty. Hold up. 